being 5 o'clock, I am calling the meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Um, uh, Chair, uh, City Councilor Maureen Carney, and members present are uh, Councilor Bill Toit, Councilor David Murphy, Councilor Jesse Adams, and uh, I will ask first, I will first announce that there is a audio and video recording of this meeting and ask if there is any public comment. Hearing none, I'll ask if there is an approval for the uh, minutes of March 10th. I will approve it. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any additions, corrections, comments? All those in favor accepting minutes? Aye. Aye. Okay, that motion is carried. And tonight we have a report of fire, EMS, and dispatch. So I'll hand it over to Chief. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Kelly. She has her son with her, so we want to let her go first. And, uh, I appreciate so that. So. And for the record, Kelly, could you just you know say your name so the camera folks at home yep. can see that? Kelly Bannister with Northampton Public Safety. Um, so I obviously I don't really have much to report because dispatch is pretty status quo, thankfully. Um, our staffing for the first time in a really long time, we're up to full staffing. Yay! It's great. Um, we have one person just completing training, and once he's released from training, we'll have four dispatchers on days, four on evenings, and three on the overnights. But in August, one of my dispatchers from second shift will be going out on maternity leave for a couple months. Um, so that'll bring us down one, but we're still enough where we won't have overtime like we've normally had. Um, for the financials, we have um, the dispatchers received a pay bump halfway through the fiscal year, which is very much appreciated and definitely needed. Um, but my, my budget took a hit with that because it wasn't planned. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do is I'm going to transfer funds in from my fire alarm monitoring account. Um, so that will be about $10,000. So that will leave some money left in the reserves, um, which is a good thing too. Our 9 grants came out for this month. Um, we'll be applying for it and hopefully have the applications in by July 1st. But for our support and incentive, we're going to get $94,000 again this year. Um, a large portion of that will go towards my salaries as I've done in the past. So we use less money of the general fund and more towards more of that. Um, anything remaining I'm going to use for either a radio upgrade or new chairs for the dispatch center. For the training grant this year, we're going to get the same amount we got last year, which was just under $19,000. Um, I want to host some classes this year that focus on personal growth, such as stress management, because we are going to be coming into some changes in the future as far as next gen 911 where the dispatchers may be getting videos of um, crimes in progress or medical calls so try to get ahead of the curve and start going through stress management and things like that um, also i want to have them have training on legal issues there's been a couple big cases through the courts recently about dispatchers becoming um, having to testify more often because of anonymous tips um, and the reliability of what the dispatchers say over the radio that the officers rely on that. So to kind of get them some training in that and understanding as to why it's so important to accurately reflect what's being told to us. Um, for our reverse 911 where we normally, we've been using Blackboard Connect for the past couple of years, we've decided to switch to Code Red. It has a lot of the same features, but it has an app that you can have on your phone. So if you have that app on your phone and you're driving through on vacation through Cape Cod or another community that might have um, code red, you can get an alert on your phone for severe weather, abduction, anything like that, that we would normally send a message out. So if we have people visiting from out of town that have code red in their own community, if they have an app on their phone, they'll get that notification that we'd be sending out, which is a really neat feature. Um, there will be cost savings with that. It's about, I think we're saving in the ballpark of $3,000 a year. Um, uh, I think that was it for that. So that, that change will be effective in July. But we did add on the website a new, um, the new website, a part where they can, where citizens can opt out online now, which we didn't have previously. That was something when we switched over to the Civic Plus website. So that has actually been really good for, we've had a lot of positive comments on that. So people don't have to fill out paper and fax it in, it'll be more immediate. Um, for training, we actually had the opportunity in October, myself and three other dispatchers went to a conference on the Cape. It was a two-day conference and it dealt with a whole slew of issues as far as management and new emerging technology coming up through the, through the system right now. Um, 
and it focused a lot on preparedness. We, the first speaker that kicked off the conference was the dispatch director for Sandy Hook Elementary or Sandy Hook Community, um, which really hit home because the size of that community and the demographics is very similar to Northampton, and the communication center is staffed the same way that we're staffed. So it's one of those, like, it does it can happen anywhere. It can happen in small town USA or big city. Um, so it's just looking at the preparedness. Um, this past weekend, I had two dispatchers go to the Navigator Conference, which was in Disney World this year. Um, so that was really, really awesome. That's a three-day conference. And that goes over just the amount of information that they came back with. They came back with a lot of um, management and leadership skills. Um, I'm going to look at my notes because I had them all written down. Uh, mentoring emergency dispatch for police, fire, and EMS. So it really covered the gamut of our responsibilities. Staff retention, training the trainer, supporting new employees, and amongst other topics that they got to go. So they were all 50-minute sessions throughout the day, from not starting at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. My grant covered their admission into the conference, which was $500 each. Um, and then we were able to come out of my budget with the flight, which was only $99 a person each way, and the hotel. So. It was definitely well worth it because the two dispatchers that one went, one was my lead dispatcher and one was the most senior dispatcher and they came back with just a renewed interest in the position um, as well as feeling a lot more self-worth to our department which gives us more buy-in. Um, when we're investing in our employees, we're getting a better employee back with it. Um, so that was a really great opportunity for them. Hopefully we can do it again next year. Um, we still continue to have our monthly staff meetings, one, and they, can, they have training every month. So those are all done in-house. We just had a representative from the train come in and do a, the first ever in the nation, a dispatch training for um, train emergencies and then the new railway system that's coming through the town. So that was a really interesting, informative session for us to, to be a part of, especially being the first in the nation being a part of it. Um, I'm still looking at having the EAP come in and do a training for, they offer a bunch of topics for free, so that's another free um, way for my employees to get more information and more life skills, more on the job skills. Um, but that's pretty much it. We still have our dispatchers attending the fire department trainings, which I think is invaluable because they get to see what they're seeing out on the streets and all the noise that they have to deal with and all the different things that they're contending with on scene that we wouldn't normally see just sitting at a console. Um, for our numbers this year, last year, 2013, we processed calls for service 4,185 through the 911 system. Now keep in mind that's not how many calls that rang into us, that's how many calls that, that generated responses. So for one incident, like a traffic accident, we might get seven phone calls. Um, for cell phones, it was 2,188. We're definitely seeing a decline in the landline 911s and more of an increase in the cell phone 911s. Um, and one thing that that's interesting is more people are starting to get it. You think about four people that live in a household, three of them might have cell phones, so that could be three phone calls from one household. The other thing is the challenges of knowing where they're calling from, um, especially any of the, like the paid by the minute phones, the track phones, they don't come with that GPS service. Um, so that's, that's another problem. I'm hoping that eventually they'll change that. But the other piece of that is the new technology that's coming through is next generation 911. The four vendors with the, the four major cell phone vendors, which are Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, have all agreed to be compliant now with next gen 911 with the text to 911. So as of May, they had to all sign that agreement. Now the state 911 is just implementing that. So they're going to have where people can text to 911. So that's something that we're going to have to deal with. But thankfully, they're going to set it up very similar to the cell phone carrier, or the cell phones when you call 911 on your cell, it goes to Northampton State Police, and then they distribute the phone calls from there. They're going to choose, they're going to identify four sites that will receive the text to 911. They'll process the call, and they'll call the correct community to let them know that they just got a text. But they're wondering how much that's going to take off, because people generally like to call. The whole um, driving force behind it is for the deaf and hard of hearing community they have no way to communicate with 911 unless they're using a TTY. So this is, that was the whole purpose of this, this process of coming up with it. But Boston will be, I think, receiving their own 
So that will be a really interesting to see how many they're going to get with such a young population there with a the college town. They're going to get more text rather than phone calls. So that's all I have. They're just uh, text transmissions. They're not. There are no photo or video files that could be sent. Right. This this phase of it in Massachusetts is going to be text only. Um, the state 901 department just put out the request for proposal for the bids. It closed in April to do the next generation 911, which is the video, uh, the pictures, and they're expecting that to be implemented in 2016 because there's going to be a whole push for training in that, just because there's so much more to it. But the big benefit is we're going to be able to push those pictures and videos out to the responders so they can, instead of getting a verbal description, they can have a physical description that they can see. Do you, do you have um, a marked delay as it's parsed out as to who gets assigned uh, from the state police trying to determine uh, responding communities? It's surprisingly quick because not only will they get that from the person calling, but they'll get it on their screen because they'll map out where they're calling from. The only um, the frustration that we see from the caller is that they they call and they, they might tell you a whole story. You might be the state police dispatcher, and now they're transferred to the community, and then they have to start all over again. Right. Right. But I don't see much of a delay. Okay. So, I mean, the, these are a lot of things that I I've never even considered. So it's actually pretty enlightening. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's, it makes perfect sense, and and the technology is changing exponentially. If you guys keep a pace, that remains a challenge. Right. Yeah, it's it is, and, and I have a lot of people. You know, we as a in general don't like changes, so it's very you know we've got people that have been doing this job for twenty years who are like, what? And we're gonna get videos. So, but you know, it's just we have to roll with it. We have to learn the new technologies because it's you know to stay back there and just think that we're only gonna get phone calls and that's sufficient is just ignorant. And I, and I think. Nationally, the the reduction of landlines in trade off with the cell phone technology is significant. Absolutely, and with the having um, cell phones, you are constantly in touch with somebody. You can always call them. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, but they did just implement the next gen nine one in Maine, so I'm going to try to get up there to a center that I have a contact with to see how their implementation and training was, and, and some of the fallouts, some of the issues that they're seeing. Oh, next gen 911? Yep, and it's next generation 911. You can look at um, the NENA website, it's NENA. 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 Yep, National Emergency Number Association. They have a lot of information on it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, um, you, had, you had a sheet you were reading some of the stats from. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just wondering, after the meeting, maybe you could just send something be easier than, I didn't get all the numbers and stuff, sure. even though we do have a video audio, I can attach that onto the minutes. Sure, I can email it to you. All right, great. Thanks. Sure. Okay, you're off the hook. Yes. <laughs> but I'm going to stay listen for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. And I come with handouts. Yeah. I'd like to email those to you, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nice call. Yeah. Yeah. Picture color, color charts. Yeah. yeah, color charts and pictures. Right. Yeah. Photo laser printer. Uh, yes. Uh, we'll see you Tuesday know. afternoon at one o'clock. It's still the day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so on uh, EMS, Chris is actually at a training session. So what I've asked him to do is to email you a PDF of the AMBU Pro reports. Uh, just so you get that rather than waiting another three months and so forth. But he will have that to you next week on that. Um, so some of the things that uh, we wanted to hit on were, first of all, uh, new engine and ambulance are in service. You may have seen them uh, driving around. Um, but what that does is we, we were having tremendous problems, especially on the fire apparatus side, keeping vehicles in service. And that would have one break and then put an older one in service and that would break and uh, so forth. So this sort of stabilizes things that uh, it gives us a new engine for uh, headquarters and we have uh, engine two which is the next newest one for Florence. So those are the primary engines and then we have uh, two fairly reliable backups. One, one that we sort of renovated and refurbed last year, engine four, uh, and actually some of that was just recently completed. Uh, and then we have a tanker pumper which we had got years ago used in the idea of consolidating an engine and a tanker. And 
that's worked out really well, not only for us, but for the response to the hill towns for mutual aid and so forth. So ju just that change really brings us from a situation where Dwayne and I were sitting there wondering what's going to break next to there's some real stability in the quality of apparatus. And, and as we go forward in the capital plan, I think we're in good shape. Uh, on the ambulance uh, side, uh, we continue to go with a larger chassis. Um, with that, we've found that we can extend the life of the unit. So another ambulance would be up this year in the capital plan. We we're able to defer that uh, and we'll be able to then go into a process of uh, rechassing a vehicle once and then purchasing a new vehicle. Uh, so as we go down, every vehicle will then be rechassis, take the box off, put it on a new chassis one time. We don't want to keep doing that because eventually the box will degrade. Uh, but that will be a cost savings attributed to that. But uh, both of these are in service and doing well. Anything you'd like to add to that for the committee uh, trials and tribulations? We're, we're doing well uh, apparatus-wise. Uh, as the chief said, uh, we're, we're stabilized. Uh, I think we've got a good fleet for a few years here to uh, you know, work with and keep things going. We're not going to have the constant breakdown of repairs. And, and both of these units, uh, they were actually purchased off of the state bid. Um, which was interesting in that we figured it saved Northampton probably in total about $50,000 by using the state bid compared to putting it up and bid ourselves. Uh, and both had a committee of, for the ambulance, firefighters and paramedics, for the engine, it was sort of all ranks in the department, to weigh in on, all right, here's the state bid, now you take it and customize it to Northampton. And uh, both did a good job. Uh, the ambulance committee was just fabulous. That worked flawlessly, and they really did a great job there. So allowing sort of the input of our people uh, to carry on is important. When you so, say the state bid, um, that's the surplus vehicles across the state? Or? No, it's basically the Fire Chiefs Association has gone statewide with ambulances, command vehicles, engines, ladders, and I think there's one other in there that they allow manufacturers to bid, and then any community can buy off of that. Um, so it creates an economy of scale. I, I think last I heard it was about $30 million spent in that bid so far. Um, and we, we were actually fortunate with the engine that we got the last, we were the last purchase of the previous bid. So we got prices that were two years older. Um, and we snuck in under the wire. Uh, I had to run to the mayor's office and get a couple of signatures at the last minute, but we were able to get it there and work it through procurement and so forth. So, but that's good. Um, so next up, but I just wanted to let you know about some work we've done uh, with the website. Uh, we had our website, which if you look at the side of our vehicles, it's northamptonfire.org. Uh, we've repointed that to northamptonma.gov slash fire, so bringing it into the city website and changing it really from a firefighters oriented site to a citizen oriented site. So we've done some good work with it. We have a new person that we put this out as a project and uh, Matt Marchand raised his hand. Uh, he's exceptional with technology. Dwayne and I told him, here's some of the goals we have and we're sort of slowly getting there. But if you get a minute, he's done a lot of work and just take a look at that new website. Um, Can you say it again? It, it's, uh, well, the, re, the it's redirect just Buar, is, right? Buar well, yeah, but if you type in northamptonfire.org, it'll right, redirect right, right. to the okay. city site. Yeah. Actually, that was one of the hardest things. I, I always thought repointing a site would be fairly easy, and we had to go through all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff to do well, that. Well, it's also yeah. different. You have to migrate. Different. You had you had different. Pop, you populated your site differently. Right. It didn't necessarily fit in the template, probably. Yep. But, and so you had to populate the, repopulate the site right. so it could conform. It looks good, though. So it, for a person, it does. a person who didn't have the old site address, I mean, they could, they could drill to, through go by going to right, NorthamptonMA, but if they wanted to just write the whole address line, is it NorthamptonMA.gov slash fire? fire. Okay, thanks. But uh, there are some neat features on that. Matt continues to, to work on it. and. As Kelly was talking about technology, we've seen the website becoming more and more important. So we've really put, put it as an ongoing project that Matt's going to continue to work on and develop. Well, one of the things that we've been able to do is we had a problem that everyone who wanted to schedule a car seat installation was calling Melissa, our administrative assistant. 
and, and she at one point was getting six to eight calls a day, and people wanted the appointment, you know, yesterday, and they couldn't wait, and so forth. We were able to integrate Schedulosity with the website, and now it's all done online. So it's reduced that administrative burden. People can see what's available. They have to sign up for it. Uh, and that's working out really well in that regard. And I think as we go forward, some of the goals that we have is to put uh, burning permits online, which would help dispatch and, and sort of automate some more uh, things that we can do there for permits and inspections over time. How are the, how are the burning permits related to dispatch right now? Uh, people call dispatch and basically produce the, the schedule and which permits are active for the day. I know they were sick of talking to me this year, so. Oh, <laughs> so um, let's see, so moving on, uh, just an update relative to sort of labor management. Uh, obviously, I think everyone knows we have contracts three years back, three years forward, which is a really good thing. Um, we have Matt Lemberg as a union president, uh, really has come forward to both myself and the mayor with, hey, we want to work together. That's a good thing. And we have a couple of initiatives that are ongoing. One is for our firefighters and deputy chiefs. Some of the contracts we had is we have the contract, but then there's a side agreement here and a side agreement there, and there's no one source. So one of the things we're trying to do collaboratively is come down to one document that is all that lives uh, for both of those and just make it simpler for, for us as we look through things and for the employee as well. Uh, and then another thing that we're working on, we've looked at as we've matured with EMS, we have what's called the impact shift. I think everyone probably remembers that, peak hours. And Councilor Murphy was referring to Tuesdays at what time? One o'clock. One o'clock was the most deadly and so forth. One of the things that, that we've seen from an operations side is we have three ambulances during the day and then we, we could theoretically staff more with recall personnel, but at night we have two. And not super often, but there's enough of a demand that we'll be sort of launching that second ambulance, generating a recall, and needing a third ambulance, that's calling mutual aid, to the point we really wanted to look at what would be the implication if we had a third ambulance at night and sort of did away with the impact shift, but pull those people into a regular rotation. So that, that's something that's sort of an ongoing discussion. Uh, I, I basically sat with uh, the union president and the mayor, and what we agreed is that, first of all, we need to collaboratively pursue this and then have a discussion with the mayor if that would go forward as a pilot program to evaluate what's the fiscal implication of it and so forth. But certainly, if you remember back a couple of years, it was a far different attitude than, hey, let's work together, sit and talk, and, and develop something collaboratively. So I think we've come a long way in that regard. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, it's certainly a different climate, a different atmosphere in the station. Um, you know, the local, I think, is very open and uh, very willing to work and, and move forward. So it's, it's neat that we've settled the contract and, you know, have a little period of time here that, you know, I think we can work together to better the organization. As I recall, there was the one, one sticking point was um, the inability to have regular meetings of the Labor Management Committee. Mm -hmm. Has that kind of gotten square away? Or is there yep. more ad hoc at this point? Or? Well, we, we've actually merged sort of the, we had an EMS committee mm -hmm. and a labor management committee. Those sort of have merged together with the idea of we're working toward that pilot program. Uh, and we have had regular meetings. Um, I'd say in the last month we've actually held off because the local needed to sort of sort out some of their things of were they even interested in doing some of this. But they've come back and we have a meeting this coming Thursday, so. Uh, well, you, you, you have very few people left that don't have at least EMT, right? I think there's... There couldn't, there's not too many guys left that, that don't do medical work as well. I think there's 12 left. And I'm not sure if that includes a retirement coming up or not. But <laughs> so, so when you think about it, a lot of them, right? A lot of the rank and file guys are doing medical shifts too. So yes, it, it affects most of your staff. Right. right. Yeah. So, and, and, and even with the with the few first responders that we have left, uh, you know, they're on the engines and to the most serious medical calls, they're responding out with that. You know, really, really providing some assistance. You know, whether it's carrying gear, uh, getting stretchers, things like that. Uh, for the guys that are doing, you know, the true EMS stuff out there, so it's kind of neat to see the, the whole organization is, you know, we really should say it's a fire slash EMS organization because, you know, it's what we do. That's that's how we transition over the years. 
And one of the things we've challenged our employees with is it's really a transition from sort of that separate fire EMS to a fire rescue stand. So what you see in California and down south for the true fire rescue departments that have embraced that as part of the mission. And, and that's what I think what we see happening of, it used to be uh, years ago when an engine went to a medical call, if an ambulance needed a driver, that was a major problem. Now it's second nature that the crews are, if it's serious call, they're putting people in the ambulance, they're driving the ambulances, they're helping out in ways that they never did before. And it's really, it's seen as more of a team effort and more seamless than it ever was. So, And it's nice that the, the engines are equipped because having, having trained people on the engines but not having the gear that they could actually use their skills right. if they're the first ones there. You know, yep, it, absolutely. So, so that's another push. leap forward. I think we were the second in the state for paramedic engines, and now there's four or five that are sort of following suit. So including Amherst went live about six months ago. So I hope the guys are trained yeah. they, without their gear. That's right. Can't do much. Mm -hmm. so. um, and then moving on to finances, um, we're, we're pretty close on OM this year, so that's something as we get to the end of the year, there's about 80,000 left. We, we may in fact need a small transfer, not a significant transfer, but I'm hoping that actually we won't, depending on how sort of the bills go and so forth. On the PS side, we will have a small surplus, and that also includes the payment of a step, which was a contractual agreement. So I, I know when we sat down and negotiated, the hope was that we could sort of include that. Uh, we weren't sure that we could, but this will be sort of the second year in a row that based on realistically budgeting overtime, we're not coming back looking for an overtime transfer. It was a surplus last year, and there'll be a surplus that will allow that payment this year. So, uh, you know, so that was my big bugaboo when we took on ambulance, you know, to, to be able to take that extended service and control the overtime. Yep. And, and by keeping you guys staffed up, that seems to work. Right, and, and we have to say no a lot. But that, that's okay, we get used to it. <laughs> um, so, so that's really finance. Uh, in terms of, of staffing, and I guess this relates to what you were saying, uh, the safer grants expiring. So right now we're at 72 personnel, uh, or slots. We actually don't have 72 personnel because we have people that have left and long-term injuries and so forth. Uh, but we'll go to 68 officially as of July 1st because those four positions from the safer grant are going away. Uh, in terms of what that means, it, it really doesn't affect staffing or staffing level on shifts. It's going to more, it will have a bigger effect on overtime. That we're taking basically one person off of each shift, that reduces the float and, and will create more overtime that way. So we'll just have to watch that as we go into next year. And that's another reason why when we talk about working with our people, that we really want to do a pilot program because all of these things sort of combine. Uh, but I think that will be the, the stress of the safer grant will produce the overtime equation. Um, with that, we have uh, four uh, moderate to long-term absences. Two of those are job-related and two are personal, so people that need knee surgery or people that just probably won't be coming back to work on a personal absence but need to go through the retirement process. We have uh, one of our firefighters who was injured on duty that has filed for retirement, but that takes about eight months to go through the process. And then we have another that uh, maybe six weeks or six months, I'll have to say. So uh, that, that's sort of the injury story, which is relatively under control compared to where things were years ago, but not at our rock bottom. Uh, some of those things, so when Dwayne tries to set the schedule up and balance who's going to the academy and the injuries and family medical leave and all those things, that becomes quite challenging. Uh, and we do have one retirement of uh, Tom Clark, expected uh, January to March, we'll, we'll see, we sort of have a window there. Uh, but I think he's looking forward to that. And we're in the process of starting a hiring process that will most likely result in five positions being hired in September. Uh, so, so our risk here for overtime increase is really that July to September window, peak vacation time, we're not going to have people on board. Uh, as we go through the hiring process now. Is it five positions this September? Yes. Mm -hmm. so. um, and that, that, those five positions are based on trying to maintain the 68? Right. Yeah. So, so it's a moving target. And every time I say five, it goes four or six. <laughs> well, the same thing with police, you know, right? They hire six guys, and 
before they come out of the academy, they lose three of them, and then they get, you know, you almost got to hire an extra right. just to wind up with what you're looking for. Yeah, and, and that's what we're trying to do is create the list and sort of take our time doing it. Um, we, we just hit sort of the last part of the previous list, and the two people we hired were temporary employees, and neither one worked out. So, uh, one left on their own, and another one left. Um, let's see, moving on to operations. So, Dwayne does a fabulous job juggling things, fire prevention, operations, doing the schedule, all that. One of the things he really took on as a project uh, for us was looking at our insurance service office rating. And that really gives you a comparative picture of where is Northampton in relation to other fire departments across the country. So I'm going to ask Dwayne to sort of walk through it. They, they just did an update of the work that he did a few years ago, uh, but it leaves us basically in the top 7% of fire departments across the country as a class 3 fire department. So, so, so basically the ISO, is, is, it used to be years ago, a little history behind it was how they set insurance rates. Uh, it was basically how well could a community fight a fire insurance company that had a vested interest in that, uh, you know, certainly on their end. So. Uh, a better a community could fight a fire, certainly it was probably more profit on their side. Uh, but it's evolved through the years, uh, kind of really, and still has some weight on it, but I don't think as much on the insurance premiums that are out there. But uh, residents don't usually see a big impact on it, but businesses do, uh, you know, commercial buildings and that type. But it's a neat process that they look at the fire department. Uh, what they really look at is uh, fire flows, which is basically our water system. Uh, they look at the dispatch end of it, and then they look at the fire department to uh, really see how well and how well equipped and prepared we are to fight a fire. Uh, like with dispatch, uh, I, I should step back a little bit. In 2002, we did a, a big full-blown study of it, uh, where we had actually a surveyor come out. He spent a week in the community. Uh, he worked with David Sparks in the water department, where we walked through basically the hydrant system, uh, how well that's you know, we're able to get fire flows out of it, how, much, how good the pressure is, and uh, the water flows. Uh, we worked with dispatch really to evaluate where they were and, uh, you know, the communication equipment and how well they are to receive alarms and, and dispatch apparatus. Uh, and with that, we actually went from a class four to a class three in 2002. Uh, last year, they came in, as the chief mentioned, to uh, do kind of what they call just a, I say a quick survey. Uh, it was one surveyor. Uh, he came into the city just for a day, uh, and I basically prepared up a kind of a big packet of documentation for him uh, that we kind of sent to it. He evaluated it, and we still stayed at a class three with that whole thing. Uh, and I know he talked to David Sparks up to the water department just to review where everything was. But kind of a neat process, uh, as the chief says, uh, we really have a, a great water system in the city uh, as the hydrants go and, and great fire flows. Uh, for a dispatch center, we're very well established in a very good communication center uh, that's able to dispatch alarms and uh, you know get get the firefighters out the door. Uh, and with technology changing, it's it's a challenge uh, in talking to the, the surveyor who came out, uh, but we're still doing really well there. And then he looks at the fire department. Uh, he breaks it down into you know how often we test equipment, you know how often do we test fire hoses? Uh, we do it yearly. That's what they're looking for. How often we test their fire pumps, which are on the trucks. Uh, and really what it is is to be prepared uh, to be able to fight a fire. Uh, they actually go so far into training records. Uh, and we've done a good job in, since 2002 of really keeping track of them and, and really understanding what, what they're looking for. So we've kind of got a neat system going that I was able to produce uh, some pretty good documentation for them to take back. Uh, but they're looking for you know, how often we do structural firefighting uh, just to keep our skills up, uh, handling hoses, throwing ground ladders, things like that. Uh, and then, you know, they even look at officer training, uh, which was kind of a, a newer one that the last time in 2002 we didn't really look at. Uh, but they look at that as, you know, having people prepared to be able to fight a fire, run an incident, and uh, be able to put the fire out. So it's, it's a neat process to go through. It's a lot of work when you're gathering the information and trying to understand what they're looking for. And, uh, but I've met some really good surveyors out through there that are some really interesting people and found that they're willing to help you a great bit, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but uh, it was exciting to see that we still stayed at three, and uh, you know, pretty pretty proud of the community for that. And I think it's not only the fire department, but uh, the water department, and uh, I think what what the city, I said you as counselors, have, have put into support the upgrades of the infrastructure, which is really cool to see.
What are the criteria for the categories? Uh, uh, we were three, we were four, what, what's the difference? It's, they they kind of weight every area. So they got like a list of things, like for us, it would be testing of uh, fire hose, testing of uh, fire pumps, and they, and they put a, a number to it. Uh, the way they kind of scale everything out is dispatch is 10%, fire department is 50%, and the water department is 40%. So they go through and look at all those categories, and, and what the surveyor does is put a rating to it, and then they develop their, their rating off of that. So if you go, if you achieve the cap one, then you'd be... Yeah, we'd be the, golden. We'd be, we'd be, okay. I think there's one Cambridge is... Cambridge is the only one in Massachusetts, I think, and then like LA County is a class mm -hmm. one department, but there's very, very few. Uh, in that packet, it talks about it's like less than 1% of usually the number uh, of class one departments and class two departments and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, so the other side of the story is if we look back, at one point, Northampton was a class five, and... Dwayne and I sort of set the goal of we wanted to be a class three. How can we do that? And Dwayne put a tremendous amount of effort in. I remember he was coming in with notebooks this thick of all stuff that in some cases we had to manufacture because we didn't have it. Um, and when we got that in 2002, we were just sort of barely getting there. We wondered, were we going to be a four or a three? It was right on the edge. And what impressed me with this is now it considers since 2002 what improvements have there been with our training records, with our equipment, with the water department infrastructure, with dispatch, and we, we sort of, I, I, after 2002, asked for what did we miss? And we circulated that around, so there's been some improvement. So we've gone from, they do it at 100% scale, uh, if you have, in the 60s, you're a class four, I believe, 70s is class three, and we're at 78.33. So really less than two points from a class two. And, and it was interesting to me to see just with those improvements going from where we're on the edge to now we're on the edge of going to the next level. Um, is, is this is this principally focused on fire suppression, not hazmat response or uh, emergency medical responses? Not, not emergency medical. They, they actually, as I said, the, the interesting thing that I found was some officer training this time that they looked at, and they did look at hazmat training. Couldn't really give me a clear answer of why. Uh, but it was in there. They have adapted over the years. The, the ISO of old really looked at your ability to fight the lumber yard fire, the right. major mm -hmm. event. Uh, and no one really did that well because no one could prepare for that scope and have that staffing and everything else. Um, now, what they do is they look at the first alarm assignment. What can you do for complying with standards to meet a first alarm response? Uh, and and I, every time I do see that they're going further and further, they never ask for officer training or anything to do with beyond fire suppression at the initial level before. So. Yeah. It's going to be hard to hit the higher points where you have some of your jurisdiction that doesn't have water. Right. It would seem to me that that would penalize a community our size with rural areas where response time's up and where you got to bring your own water. That would seem to me to put you at a disadvantage. We're a city like Cambridge, small geographic area, complete public utilities everywhere. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a real advantage over that. Right. And, yeah. and they take into account, it's, it's interesting how they look at it. You know, we certainly have the rural areas with no water supply, uh, but their big concern is there's not much commercial uh, right. businesses out through there. Uh, they're very interested in downtown uh, mm -hmm. and what we have here. We got great water from a fire department standpoint, downtown as far as pressures. Uh, so they really look at that. A huge, tremendous thing was what the city's put into the water department. I say, you know, i.e., the, the treatment plant and all, and all what that brought to that uh, table, because it really brought. I think that we gathered a lot of points in that because of, you know, before the water treatment plant, some of the pressures in the cities were were down and stuff, but putting the treatment plant in and it really stabilized a lot of pressures in some some areas, some remote areas. I know, uh, up in Leeds, up on top of Mains Hill. Right. Uh, certainly, was an area that we that improved the, the yeah. water. I think it's, it's I think that's the way it gets here. No, mm -hmm. Yeah, down. I think that actually surprised David yeah. Sparks uh, that I don't think they anticipated it, it was going to be that good. But that was a huge, huge thing to help us kind of boost our I say our numbers with that. Uh, and then certainly with the fire department, I think you know certainly we we've got some new apparatus in there that they look at the age of apparatus, they look at the equipment, uh, the training, and and you know really we the city's done a good job I think of keeping. Uh, the equipment new and you know keeping new technology coming in so it's kind of cool and I thank you guys for supporting all that. Well, I, and I was, I was going <clears> to <throat> add about Cambridge they have the one of the wealthiest private 
colleges located there that might have a pilot that might uh, benefit one. from Yes, yeah, exactly. And I believe they negotiated some interesting pilots that probably have a lot to do with focus, I don't know this, but on fire suppression, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, given that all the principal structures in that community are, right. are college related. So. And many sprinkler. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And if you guys had a few, you know, billion dollars hanging around, we, I'd really love to go for a class too. But. Well, I'll see if we can find a private college somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's interesting, the, the way they do it, so by us being a three versus a four or five affects the industrial and commercial base for their insurance rates, mm -hmm. and then they ban three through five together. So for residential, it doesn't matter if we're a five or a three. If we went to a two, theoretically, there'd be some residential benefit across the city. So, mm -hmm. but uh, as you get closer to that two, the points are also harder to get. Right, and, and, and that two low hanging is actually far away. Yeah. 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 It's so. a little hard, but the, the, the incline becomes a yeah. little steeper. Yeah. But, but I really thought that sort of the whole package was worth sharing with you of it demonstrates continued improvement, it demonstrates the effort that Duane has put forward over several years, and it really shows you comparatively how we compare to other fire departments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most everybody's behind us. Which is where we want. <laughs> um, let's see, last, last up is EMS. Just uh, one note is we're in the middle of a transition from for years, it was you had to be a Massachusetts registered EMT paramedic, and now the state has flipped the system to go into the national registry. And that's created a few hiccups of it changes the number of hours and whether there's a refresher and so forth. So we're in the process of we actually need to sit down with our folks and impact bargain some of those changes. For example, one of the things that changes is we have EMT intermediates where they can start intravenous and do some airway management. Uh, that level of certification is going away. Those people can choose to take about a 100 hour course to go to the next level or they could go back to being a basic EMT. So, you know, we're, we're in a different place too. We have far more paramedics than we had, and we need to sort of sort out how we approach that and where we're going to go through some impact bargaining. Well, we, and traditionally, we've, um, let, we've provided the release time and training for yep. folks to do that. Is, that. is that how you expect we're the same direction you'd be going? Or? I think we're, we're going to continue to do that. There's sort of more of that that then produces a budget impact for us. But there's also some different things that if there isn't a refresher, how do people get those skills? And, and I mean, we're, we're scratching our head ourselves. That for example, without a refresher, you have to prove that you took 20 hours in the following categories. And I calculated up to take separate courses to get there would be about 60 hours. So that's a fairly significant hit on both the employee's time and our budget. Yeah. Um, but there, there are many aspects of it. It changes certification from January to April. Uh, for example, I'm up next year myself. I had taken 24 hours of continuing ed between January and March. And that was all gone because now you have to take it within two years. And January to April just went away. They no longer recognize it. So, so we have another budget impact with that, and, and we need to work with our employees with that, too. Well, it's true enough. You're staffing 68 rather than 72. It's harder to spare the people. Right. So, And incentive-wise, you may have to make the call, how long is this person going to be around? You know, who do I invest in? And, yeah. You know, where, where. Right. So, so that's just something that's going to be going on probably over the next year. And I know there was one article in the paper. You may hear some other things on that. And the, as we impact bargain it, you may hear some things that way as well. Um, and the final thing was I asked Deputy Norris just to email you the statistical report so we can see if it is Tuesday at 4 p.m. <laughs> uh, so you'll have those by next week. Uh, Maureen, if you'd like, I can yeah, email you this. I don't have this electronically, but I could scan it as a PDF if you that, want. That's fine too. Okay. Yeah, then I can just attach it all along the minutes. So with, with that, any questions? Or? A long, Kelly brought this up the, about uh, about um, the fact that we are going to have a, a refurbished train line coming through with with passenger systems, and of course also the, always the standing hazmat 
issues. Is, what, it, is, uh, is there any special training relative to passenger train systems that needs to be? We, we had the railroads out this February. Uh, they came in and did trainings for the whole department. Uh, basically, oh, kind of awareness, we call it. You know, how the trains work, how they operate, you know, emergency shutoffs, things like that. Uh, I think we're going to see a little bit more rollout uh, with that as we develop the tracks out there. So they, they, they approached us last fall uh, and, and we're looking to come and their goal was to hit the communities up and down the rail line. So I, I think it's going to be ongoing and uh, I'm not sure, I haven't heard a lot about freight, uh, how much freight will be coming up and through here, but I think if they get the line up and running, which they've upgraded it, uh, they've got all new ties and rails, I think, through there. Uh, it's probably a matter of time before we see some type of freight. Because they say it's pretty cheap to ship by rail now. Uh, well, it's also, it also seems to be the uh, preferred means by which to ship uh, either crude oil or yeah. uh, uh, fracked yeah. oil, natural gas. What, they, what they're seeing a lot now uh, is uh, ethanol. Mm -hmm. is, uh, that's All of those boom. Yeah, that's, that's, that's coming through uh, basically Pittsfield down to West Springfield, through Westfield, uh, seeing a lot come there, going down into Connecticut, and then on the eastern end of the state, uh, a lot's coming through kind of like the, the uh, northeast up through there, uh, Devon's area, and uh, heading down towards uh, the south coast. Well, the, there are new, supposedly new standards that have not been enacted or enforced on the, mm -hmm. uh, rigidity of, uh, of, the, of the cars that are carrying and transporting these materials. Yeah, they, they've done quite a bit of job of uh, kind of trying to make them uh, a little bit more crash proof, per yeah. se. Um, well, folks in, I think, West Virginia this week yeah. didn't get to experience that. And, no, no. Um, and, yeah. and we hear more and more of really epic, yeah. cataclysmic uh, explosions yeah. usually associated with yeah. bringing balls substances through the center mm -hmm. of community so yeah and, that, and that's a huge thing uh like in west springfield there's a pretty big depot down there just across from the big e and, and it's amazing the uh the amount of freight that goes in and out of there in a day uh, I'm, I'm on the state hazmat team and, and you know certainly we've had a couple instances already this this spring uh yeah. down there but the rail people are telling us it's just getting busier and busier yeah uh they're moving stuff it's moving by freight uh, a lot more as I said, I guess it's the cheapest method out there, and uh, they're really doing it. So I, I guess I would probably say that it's only a matter of time before we see some type of freight uh, right. possibly coming down down through our rail line here. And probably with that some type of incident, we've had a few that you know the cars skip the tracks, but it's something that you really wouldn't care about is paper or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Not going to create a major problem. So so now the dynamic could change. Uh, and with that, there's two regional resources we rely on. One, uh, Dwayne's second in charge of the Western Mass Hazmat Team, which is a state entity, and really is people from all over the area that come together and form that team, and they're extremely well trained and go all over doing these things. Uh, and then we also have the uh, Western Technical Rescue Team, where it's divided into sort of three groups. Uh, we have one of those divisions sort of based out of Northampton, uh, and between ourselves, Amherst, Franklin County, they provide a technical rescue presence, whether it's cutting into cars or stabilizing things, and uh, sort of that bigger uh, component of beyond cutting a car apart and things like that. So, two good assets. And, and people talk about fire services, gee, they should become regional. Those are the specialty things that are really sort of unseen and are evolving, and it is already regional because no community could afford it on their own. Right, no community could so. sustain. Right. See, I think one of the bigger impacts we're going to see with the rail coming through is uh, like the Damon Road crossing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to, you know, how many cars or how many trains will be coming through on a day. Right. I mean, right now we may see one, uh, but if you're, I guess, it's eventually going to end up in Montreal. That's uh, the you know, that's the theory. Yep. Yeah. That uh, that you know, how many crossings will, will happen and, and how will that impact kind of really the the King Street Bridge Road intersection. Well, it's already failed. That's a failed yeah. juncture right there anyway already, so it's in, in, without the train. That's <laughs> <Yes>, without <laughs> the train. And the DOT has had us supposedly in the hopper for close to 30 years now, I guess. Yeah, but yeah. Must be coming up. Passenger yeah. train is going to be a shorter wait than any of the freights that typically go by anyway. Yeah, it'll be pretty, yeah. pretty quick. But it's just more frequent. So yeah. The freight train
trains are going to be fractions of a mile long. I know. And, that's, I that's know. Right. Yeah. and they have, and they can only go, I think, like so, like eight miles an hour. So yeah, yeah. they got speed limits that they can, yeah. can go. Uh, and certain passenger trains, I think, will be a little bit faster. But you know, I, I that's one of the, the first things I see is. But not back. too fast because they'll have just taken off. I mean, they, you know, where that junction yeah. is, is not far. They're, they're getting they're redoing the depot station. down there. There's a new new sports bar going in, and yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a couple of beers by the time they get up to King Street. That's what they're all into. Just one quick question about Narcan. Um, okay. I know that the police actually starting next week, I guess, are finally feeling mm -hmm. that they're at least covered legally mm -hmm. to accommodate the governor's order. But you guys, we've, we've had a number of responses, a lot actually, yeah. uh, throughout the valley, but here in town as well. Um, and but so up until this point you guys have been providing coverage for Narcan administration, I imagine. The right. PD yeah. has not been doing it. Yep. Um would the PD doing it I, I was assume would also help support and it, it hopefully reduce But you're still gonna to respond to those, right? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you still need a paramedic intervention and probably some other drugs and still fluid. Still to transport too. Right. So, mm -hmm. Yes. So no. it, it's just a it gets it in quicker and potentially yeah. turns things around quicker. Yeah. It's Depending on your arrival time, if your units are tied up, right, mm -hmm. get some started before you get there. Well, and citizens can carry narcan. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and with heroin becoming such an epidemic, the DA has really started to push it. I know we have people going to some of those trainings just so we're aware of what other agencies are doing as well. Uh, it used to be we were the only ones. Now there's other people, and you have to look for that and be sensitive to that. I had a constituent ask me the other day about, do you have a vehicle hit a pole? We did. They asked Unfortunately, I'm going to run into that person sooner or later, so tell me what you can, because they're going to ask you. I haven't enough. seen them in a while, but I know they're going to ask you. Well, unfortunately, it was the Different brand person. new engine that uh, was going to a cardiac arrest on State Street, and as they turned, the tires didn't go over the curb, but the pole hit the top of the vehicle as it went by. So it scraped up the compartments. The pole hit the vehicle? The pole was leaning? Well, yeah. you're approaching on the road. If you look at the pole, if you're going up, you're going west on, on uh, yeah. Finn Street, and yep. they're actually taking a right onto State. Yeah. And they're trying to make the corner. There was a car coming out, but the pole does lean a little mm -hmm. bit. Okay. And, uh, I don't think it moved to hit the vehicle, though. I think no. the vehicle hit the pole. <laughs> but in, in making so. that, that right hand, Turn they, they did. Uh, okay, so coming uh, down Prospect and on and then right yeah, on. Actually, they're coming. They went King Street up. Oh, on King up Street. And then left on State. And left onto State. Right, right, yeah, right. right. Okay. Oh, going place. towards going Angus down Fox. to, to yeah. the extension yeah. State. Yeah. I'm going your way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So I'm thinking of it. So. <clears throat> there's two. There's two. The that intersection's problematic. There's a stop sign stuck in the middle of the sidewalk for the left-hand turn. <laughs> <laughs> there's the sign that's on the on on your side that's that's also leaning out to mm -hmm. so what what's uh so you guys gotta <clears throat> do some cosmetics on that then? yeah, yeah that, that's sort of going out to bid now to see what the the true dollar cost of it is it's probably about ten thousand dollars it's still it's functional right so it's still functional it's in service today and it will just go out get that cosmetic work done and be back in service so <clears throat> We gritted our teeth a little bit with that one, but sort of the cost of doing business. And, and to tell you the truth, looking back over the years, we have been extremely lucky that we haven't had more vehicle accidents. And uh, some of our people have done a great job. I remember hearing one that someone actually jumped out in front of a fire, piece of fire apparatus going to a call to try and get run over, and they stopped. So uh, our people have done a great job, and these are very big vehicles. <laughs> Wouldn't that be covered by insurance? The, um... Oh yeah, it is. Oh, okay, so it's not. Okay, so it's not. Yeah, okay. yeah and Points, PD right. rolled a cruiser, brand new cruiser, so. <laughs> rolled it. Yeah. Off Audubon Road. Audubon Road. Yeah. They can't turn like those cruisers. I'm not sure what what was related to it. I think that, it, it, you get I don't know. Over, you get run over by one of those engines, Narcan is not gonna help no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> those are big heavy things. But that, that would do the job if you wanted to get mm -hmm. run over. I remember Deputy Chief Down, I think he was probably a captain back then, he called me up and told me this. You're not gonna believe this. Uh, and someone literally tried to kill themselves by 
darting out in front of a piece of apparatus with lights and siren. And yeah. They did a good job. So I, I've heard more things that they've done good jobs with than little scrapes and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, okay. I'm exhausted. <laughs> nope. That's fair. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. And you're going to send the, these handouts, the yep. your little report, and that little PDF. And I'll okay. attach them all and put the minutes for next yeah. time. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good yeah. night. Brian, take care. Have a good night. All right. So, for you folks, if they'll ask if there is any business that the chair did not reasonably anticipate, we can discuss. I don't know. You're the chair. It's a big place. None that I know of. Okay. So, no business. I'll move for adjournment. I'll second. Okay. Adjourned at 5.56. All right.